Welcome back. In this section, I'm going to talk about some of the biggest events we see day to day if you're a shareholder. So what I'll do is I'll start by talking about some of those common dividend types that we see. Uh, dividends are one of the most basic events that we see if we're shareholders, so I thought I'd start with them. Uh, we'll talk about why some firms don't pay dividends and some firms do. Uh, I'll talk about something that you're probably less familiar with in terms of share buybacks. And I'll show you some of the more recent evidence with respect to buybacks or repurchases. And then finally, I'll talk about some other events like spinoffs and splits. Okay, so I'm pretty sure everyone watching this video knows what a dividend is. Uh, we're just talking about a payment from a firm to shareholders, usually in the form of cash. Uh, let's talk about how that process occurs. Depending on the firm, usually the firm's board of directors will ask the CEO to begin issuing a dividend to shareholders, or sometimes the CEO will recommend the dividend. Regardless of how this happens, the board is going to have to sign off on the dividend and decide the amount of the dividend. Dividends are currently taxed at the same rate as realized capital gains, meaning that you as an investor that receives a dividend should be indifferent between the dividend and the comparable increase in the value of your stock. Uh, this hasn't always been the case, however. Changes in uh, dividend and capital gain tax rates have been shown to affect the decision-making of firms, uh, you know, whether or not they issue dividends. Now, obviously, it's better to issue dividends when the dividend tax rate is lower than the capital gains tax rate. Uh, when the dividend tax rate is higher, though, it's better that the firm reinvest net income into new firm operations to increase the share price rather than paying out dividends. Next, dividends are also extremely consistent. The decision to initiate a dividend is a monumental decision because once the dividend is announced, investors expect the firm to continue pay, paying the dividend. This is when we talk about regular quarterly dividends, this is what we're talking about. When a firm announces it's going to pay a regular quarterly dividend, investors expect the firm to have enough positive cash flow in the future to pay that dividend essentially forever. This leads me to one of the most important things that you need to remember with respect to dividends. Dividends are signals. They are signals that the firm's board of directors believes that the firm will be profitable for the foreseeable future. They're signals that the firm will have the cash flow to maintain the dividend to the end of time, practically. Uh, firms could potentially increase the dividend, but they will never want to decrease the dividend. Decreasing or outright cutting the dividend indicates to investors that the firm's board has doubts about its future profitability. When a firm cuts, suspends, or eliminates a dividend, in the investor response can be dramatic. So let me show you what I mean. I took this data from a very, very famous academic study from 1988 by Helene Palapu. Uh, what this shows you is the immediate investor response when a firm initiates a dividend and when it omits a dividend or gets rid of a dividend. So these T and T minus one and T plus 20, T is the day. So day T is the day that the dividend is uh, announced or omitted. So from T minus one to T basically means from the end of the prior day to the end of the day that the dividend was announced. There is a about a 4% increase in the share price when a firm initiates a dividend. On the day or around the day that a firm omits a dividend, there's almost a 10% decrease in the share price. And that, I think, is one of the most important results that I can show you. Investors respond very positively to dividend announcements, but they respond even more negatively to dividend cuts and dividend omissions. So that's why I say dividends are signals. Investors respond to that new information. Okay, now I need to discuss the factors that determine whether a firm will pay a dividend. And you should absolutely know these for an exam. Quite frankly, you know, if I have like three or four choices, this sets us up nicely for a multiple choice question. Okay, so first thing that's going to drive the, div the dividend decision, earnings per share or profitability. Uh, by now, you should be familiar with this formula for EPS. Uh, basically, it's just net profit after taxes minus dividend minus preferred dividends divided by number of common shares outstanding. 
Now, there's a positive relationship between EPS and dividends per share. Firms that are more profitable are more likely to pay a dividend than firms that are unprofitable. I mean, if you don't have the cash, you're not going to pay a dividend. Another factor that's going to affect whether a firm pays a dividend or not is the firm's growth prospects. And this one's a bit tricky. Uh, firms that have really good growth prospects are likely to need to continue to reinvest any uh, net income that they've earned. So it, it's kind of counterintuitive, but the firms with the highest growth prospects are actually least likely or very unlikely to start to pay out a dividend. Firms that are more stable and really don't have a lot of good growth prospects, but are also profitable, they have to do something with that cash. And once their growth prospects kind of decrease, that's when the board will start to say, hey, we need to start to pay out cash to shareholders. Next, future profitability. Uh, firms that issue a dividend will need to maintain that dividend. Uh, in order to ensure they're able to issue a dividend in the future, they need to ensure that they're going to be profitable in the future and have cash on hand uh, to fund that disbursement. And this is why future expected profitability is positively related to dividend payouts. You know, it's similar to you know current earnings per share. Basically, we want to make sure that we're going to be able to maintain that dividend so that we don't see this negative reaction if we have to cut or omit the dividend. Finally, and there are many other factors driving this dividend decision, but this one's probably, you know, the fourth most important, uh, loan agreements. Uh, while some firms have no debt on their balance sheet, that's not always the case. Firms that borrow from investors or receive a bank loan, like a revolving credit agreement, they might be subject to what we call debt covenants in their loan agreement. Now, debt covenants indicate specific actions that the firm can and can't take when it owes its creditors money. There are many debt covenants that actually specify that a firm cannot issue a dividend or must not increase its dividend while it owes money to its creditors. Okay, so that's that. Now, let's talk about the dates you should know with respect to dividends. Uh, the first date is the declaration date or the announcement date. Now, uh, this is the date that the board announces a specific dividend uh, amount. Uh, now, if there's new information here, this is the day that we're going to see the share price of the stock move the most. Uh, historically, dividend initiations see positive investor responses. Dividend cuts or omissions see very negative investor responses. Uh, now, one point I should also make here is that the price will absolutely be volatile around this date if it if there's new information. You know, if the firm has never offered a dividend and it announces a dividend, there's going to be a, a very, very, very large volume of shares traded around this date. Now, the next date you should know is the ex-dividend date. And this is the date that you need to be an official shareholder by uh, in order to be eligible to receive the declared dividend. If you hold shares before this date, you become the shareholder of record, and you will receive the dividend even if you're sh you sell your shares after this date. Uh, this is basically the date when they determine who owns the shares, or uh, the date before this is the date. The, the X date is really the date when those shares start to trade without the dividend priced in. Uh, so this is a very important date. If you want the dividend, you need to buy those shares before this date. Now, the date of record, this is probably the least important date on here. It's just the date that, uh, you know, the information uh, gets sent to the SEC. So it's kind of like the date that that the shareholder of record is identified. Typically, the date of record is, I mean, one, two, uh, one or two days after the ex-dividend date. Uh, basically, this is the date when we actually, or the SEC records, who is the registered shareholder. And then finally, the payment date. And this date, uh, this is historically when the checks went out in the mail. Nowadays, it's the date when you electronically receive cash in your brokerage account. It, you can sometimes call this the payable date. This date is going to uh, come eh, usually a month after the the ex-dividend date and the date of record. And let's take a look at this. So for 
I thought I'd pull some actual data here from 2018 through 2020. Uh, these are all the dates we were just talking about. So we have the declaration date, also known as the announcement date, and the most recent one on this list, uh, 1-8-2020. So it was cash dividend for 15 cents per share. If you wanted to receive that dividend, you had to be a shareholder before 1-29-2020. The record date was a day after, so you know that was the day that the, the information on shareholders went to the SEC, and the day the checks went out in the mail, so to speak, was March 2nd. All right, now, there are a lot of different types of dividends out there. Uh, the most common and the most basic type of dividend is the cash dividend. And regular quarterly cash dividends are really what we think of when we think of dividends. Uh, typically, you get the same dividend paid out every single quarter. I mean, the Here's a good example from Ford. I just showed you, you know, the cash dividend amount is being paid every quarter and it's 15 cents for several periods. Uh, they, they cut their dividend in 2018. Now, different from the cash dividend, we can also have a stock dividend. And the stock dividend is essentially a payment of additional shares of stock. Uh, a good example would be if you own 10 shares of stock and the company pays out a 10% stock dividend, you're going to receive one new share of stock for every 10 shares that you currently own. Uh, now, a bit different here, I mean, you're, you're just getting a new share. Now, one thing I should note here is there's a reason why these aren't that common. When every investor is getting a 10% stock dividend, there's more shares outstanding, and that means in the future, the earnings per share should go down. So these can actually be detrimental to the valuation of the stock. Uh, cash dividends are far, far more common than stock dividends. Now we do have a couple of very important calculations or uh, you know uh, formulas that you should know. These are probably the two most common uh, ratios relative to dividends. First is the dividend yield, and this is just a measure of the percentage paid out to shareholders. So it's it's just the dividends per share divided by the market price of the stock. Dividend yields are typically going to be less than 10%. I mean, uh, a very high paying dividend or a uh, very high dividend yield might be something like 6%. I mean, that, that would be very, very high. Uh, next, we have the dividend payout ratio, and this is just the percentage of earnings per share that are getting paid out in the form of a dividend. Uh, for most firms, that's going to be less than 50%, but quite frankly, in some cases during some time periods, you can actually see a dividend payout ratio greater than 100%. Uh, this occurs when a firm has negative earnings but still wants to maintain their dividend, or maybe they have low earnings and still wants to ma want to maintain their dividend. Okay, now I need to talk about the alternative to dividends, repurchases or stock buybacks. Uh, now, repurchases, these occur when a firm buys back its own shares on the open market from specific investors. When a firm repurchases its own shares, that reduces the number of shares outstanding and it increases the future earnings per share uh, for each future shareholder. The firm can choose what to do with the shares when it repurchases them. It can either cancel them or reissue them. Uh, now, uh, if the firm cancels its shares, uh, that's just it. I mean, there's no more shares. They just eliminated those shares from circulation. If it, however, chooses to hold those shares, those shares become what's called treasury stock. Basically, these shares just kind of sit in the corporate vault and uh, the firm can do whatever they want. I mean, these are shares that just kind of, you know, the firm can issue them to anyone they want. They might issue them to management or employees as a performance award. But yeah, th that's that. Uh, these shares, uh, when they're held by the company, they don't receive any dividends. The firm can, you know, in the future cancel these shares. And, you know, like I said, these the firm can use these for all kinds of things. They can reward uh, employees. They can use them uh, later in M&A transactions. Uh, you know, they can oh, use these shares to pay stock dividends. There's a lot of flexibility here, which is why a lot of those bought back shares don't get canceled. Okay, 
now it's time to talk about why firms might repurchase shares. And I have here listed three of the most prominent reasons why they might buy back their shares. The most obvious reason is maybe they believe their stock is undervalued. You know, the management and the board of the company have a lot of private information that the public doesn't have. So maybe they've found that uh, the shares are dramatically undervalued and it's a good time to actually buy those shares back on the open market rather than making other investments. You know, they can decrease the number of shares outstanding and dramatically increase the earnings per share. Another reason why the firm might repurchase its own shares is because it's Maybe it had a really good quarter or a really good year, and it's got a lot of excess cash on hand, but it doesn't have a lot of good growth prospects. So rather than letting that cash sit on the balance sheet or in a bank account somewhere, it's, I mean, it's prudent to return that cash to shareholders and dividends. These are long-term signals, so you wouldn't want to use a, a quarterly dividend to do this. Rather, you would just buy back your own shares because uh, repurchases, as we'll talk about in a few seconds, these are a short-term signal. They're a, a signal of short-term good performance. Uh, so that's the second reason. The, the third reason is that maybe the firm is facing a hostile takeover and they need to defend themselves. Now, I've not really talked about hostile takeovers, but these do happen from time to time. Basically, a hostile takeover occurs when some organization, it might be a hedge fund or uh, some very large investor or maybe another company comes to the firm's management and board and says, we are, we want to buy your company. So sell it to us at a certain price. Now the firm's management, if they sell out, uh, and the board as well, they might be out of a job. Maybe they think this, this hostile takeover is not a good idea. So they might try to defend against it. And when a firm is trying to defend against a hostile hostile takeover from say like a hedge fund they do have a couple of tactics that they can undertake they can use some poison pill tactics uh that's probably uh, a conversation for a corporate finance course uh, but they could also do something like oh let me give you an example uh bill ackman is a big hedge invest hedge fund uh, investor. And what he might do to acquire a company whose management don't want that company to be acquired is he might go out to all the shareholders and say, Hey, this, this stock is trading for like $50 a share. I'll offer you $60 a share to sell your shares to me today. And, uh, this, this kind of tender offer, this is popular amongst, uh, corporate raiders. Now, to defend against this tactic, what the board and the management of the team of the f firm might do is go to Bill Ackman and say, you know, our share price is 50. We, you're offering 60. I'll tell you what, we'll offer you 65 for all the shares that you have outstanding in order for you to sell your shares and go away. Don't continue this hostile takeover. So this is the last reason why a firm might repurchase its, sh uh, its shares. It would buy back its shares from a hedge fund investor or host uh, a corporate raider at a premium to defend against a hostile takeover. Okay, so you might be wondering, why are you less familiar with repurchases or buybacks than you are with dividends? I mean, we hear about dividends all the time, but corporate buybacks, they kind of fly under the radar. Well, there's a reason for that. Until the early 1980s, repurchases were considered stock price manipulation by the SEC. Uh, that's because when a firm buys back its own shares, its future earnings per share will increase and the high demand for shares could actually push the price of the stock higher on the open market. Uh, however, in 1982, the SEC passed a rule that essentially uh, legalized repurchases. And since then, repurchases have become more and more common. In fact, I thought it'd be a good idea to show you just how common uh, repurchases have become relative to dividends. So I did manage to uh, collect this data. I pulled this from, oh, I think Aswath Damodaran's website. Uh, and what you can see here is the total value of dividends versus repurchases or share buybacks, as they're sometimes known. And as you can see, historically, you know, all the way through the late 80s or so and 
uh, 90s, dividends still dominated. But by about 2000, buybacks had become the main form of uh, returning cash to shareholders. I mean, in certain periods like 2007, the overwhelming majority of cash returned to shareholders was in the form of repurchases rather than dividends. It, now, one thing I should also say is that the firms returning this cash to shareholders, uh, you know, most of this cash is coming from the big companies, the blue chip companies. So, you know, the stocks repurchasing shares or the companies repurchasing shares, these are going to be smaller companies, whereas the firms paying dividends are going to be larger, more established companies. All right. So uh, we do have a couple of remaining events to talk about. And I'll start off by talking about spinoffs. Now, spinoffs occur when a firm's management and board believe it would be beneficial to divest a subsidiary or division and create a new standalone company. When a firm does this, all of the shareholders of the old firm then become shareholders of the uh, both the old firm and the new firm. Basically, when a spinoff spin -off occurs, uh, shareholders now own shares of two different companies. From the shareholders' perspective, they, I mean, this is potentially a good thing. And there have been a lot of recent spinoffs. I can give you all kinds of examples. Uh, so I have some listed here. So historically, Land's End was a brand owned by Sears. Sears spun them off. So if you were a shareholder of Sears, after the spinoff, you own shares of Sears and Land's End. Uh, other examples would be uh, News Corp by 21st Century Spot, uh, Fox, TripAdvisor by Expedia. One of my favorite examples here would be Yum Brands and Yum Brands China. I'll probably bring this up in class, uh, but for a long time, I was a shareholder in Yum Brands, uh, which is the parent company of really three big fast food franchises, Pizza Hut, KFC, and oh, Taco Bell. Uh, now, Yum Brands, they had operations all around the world, and I think about a year or two after I purchased those shares, they spun off their Chinese operations because th those Chinese operations were very, very different than their American and other operations. So at that point, I became a shareholder of Yum Brands China and Yum Brands. I eventually sold my Yum Brands shares. I still own my shares in Yum Brands China. Okay, so why do spinoffs occur? Pretty obvious question. Well, perhaps the firm has a division that's really problematic or has become less productive. If a firm has a division that you know it's that's problematic and the firm's trying to sell it, but there's no buyers, it's often much easier to spin that division off into a new enterprise with new management. And this, I mean, a good example of this would be like Foster's Group, which owns uh, Foster's Beer. Uh, they spun off a, a subsidiary called Treasury Wine Estates into a, a publicly traded company. Now, one other big reason why a spinoff occurs is because maybe the firm has become too diversified. Uh, so companies like GE or Berkshire Hathaway, they tend to have operations in a, a host of different industries and sectors. And there's something out there, a, a very well-known phenomenon called the diversification discount, where diversified companies actually trade at a discount to more focused companies in, that only operate in one industry. And one of the big reasons that we, we suspect this occurs is because, well, the firm's management might not have expertise in all of those different industries. So one of the ways that a firm can kind of refocus on core products in areas where it has a competitive advantage is to just spin off assets. So they might spin off assets that are operating, that are being managed in a different geographic area like Yum Brands China, or companies might spin off entire divisions that are in a, a sector that it has no uh, significant uh, competitive advantage in. So GE, a couple of years ago, it, it spun off Synchrony Financial, which handled a lot of uh, the, the uh, financial operations of GE. All right, now the last event that I wanted to talk about in this video is a stock split. I know I've already talked about stock splits in prior lecture videos, but I figured, you know, this is an important event in the life of a firm or the life of stock, so I, sh I should mention it. Now, stock splits occur when a firm increases the number of shares by exchanging a specified number of, of new shares uh, for each outstanding share. So a classic stock split might be a two-for-one split where if you owned one share prior to the split, 
that one share now becomes two shares. And, you know, we can see other share splits. So it might be a five for one split where, you know, your each share now becomes five shares, each worth one fifth as, as much. There's all kinds of examples of this in the real world. I mean, we'll see the big tech companies split fairly regularly because their share price increases to the point where now your share price is like $600 and the average investor is like, that's too pricey for me. I'm not going to buy shares. Uh, so for example, Starbucks, uh, back in 2015, they, their share price had appreciated to 95.23. And so they decided to undertake a two for one split after the split went to into effect. Each shareholder now had twice as many shares trading at 47.65. So that's the basics of a split. This isn't anything that would be too noticeable and some companies will actually do multiple splits in their lifetime, uh, but it is an event that is worth mentioning, so that's why I mentioned it. Okay, so let's summarize. Uh, dividends, beyond everything else that we talked about, dividends are signals. They are signals of a firm's future cash flows and the management and the board's belief in the company's future. Regular cash dividends, special cash dividends, and stock dividends, they all exist. There's a range of different dividends, so it behooves you as an investor to know what kind of dividend is being announced. We also talked about repurchases, and repurchases are used for a variety of reasons from uh, you know, buying back underpriced securities or underpriced shares to defending against a hostile takeover. Uh, firms also now distribute far more cash using repurchases than dividends, and I, I only see that trend increasing. And then we talked about spinoffs and stock splits. Spinoffs create entirely new entities, whereas stock splits just allow a firm to decrease its share price while maintaining its market cap. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.